So, as you know, we've been going over union with Christ in the Bible. It's a biblical theological theme. So, this morning, we find ourselves in the book of Galatians. So, uh, if you would open up your Bible to the book of Galatians, and there should be handouts in the foyer, I believe, um, and I think some were already handed out. So, we're going to be pretty strictly following the handout this morning. So, as you see, we're going to be looking at six sections. We're going to be looking at one, the background of the letter, two, union with Jesus Christ. That is, um, we're going to talk about what union with Christ actually means. Three, we're going to talk about um, what it means to be crucified with Christ as it's found in uh, the end of Galatians chapter two. Then we're going to look at uh, Galatians chapter three, where it talks about substitution, that is Christ becoming a curse for us. And then the end of Galatians chapter three. We're going to talk about being baptized into and clothed with the person of Jesus Christ. And then uh, lastly, we're going to talk about what it means to be severed from Christ, severed from his person. That's in Galatians chapter 5. So we talked about um, three different characteristics of union with Christ. We've talked about um, those three characteristics over and over and over again in this series. So if anybody can remember, what are those three different uh, characteristics Don't be shy. Pastor Michael. Participation, identification, and incorporation. Yeah, very good. So um, we're going to talk about those three things uh, specifically at the end of Galatians chapter 3. It is really, really clear at the end of Galatians 3. So that's going to be our main text, um, but we're going to just walk through the book of Galatians, and uh, you'll see it over and over again, um, but all three of them are right there at the end of Galatians 3, so we'll talk about that in a minute. So first, the background of the letter. In the book of Galatians, um, Paul is speaking to uh, uh, a group of people, Christians, who are looking to go back to Judaism. So in Galatians chapter 4, he talks about two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. So uh, there's the bond woman and the free woman. So throughout uh, the book of Galatians, you're going to see this theme coming up, the old covenant, the new covenant, and then the modes of entering into those covenants. So a little bit of an analogy. Uh, on your left-hand side, you've got a door. And above this door, it says the old covenant. And there's a key to this door. The key to this door is being born a Jew, circumcision, keeping the law. That's the key to get into this door. And behind this door are some blessings. The physical land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, um, being blessed with your kneading bowl. I don't even know what that is, but it's in Deuteronomy 28. So <laughs> um, all kinds of physical, temporal blessings behind this door, okay? And then on your right-hand side, you have a door, and above it says the new covenant. And the key to get into, the, into this door, the mode of entering into this covenant, is faith. And behind this door lies Christ and all of the eternal blessings that come with him, our eternal inheritance. So what the um, Galatians are trying to do, as you can see in Galatians chapter 1, is they're distorting the gospel. And the way that they do that is they're trying to open up this new covenant door with an old covenant key. They're trying to um, use the mode of entering into the old covenant. They're using that mode, which is circumcision and keeping of the law, natural generation, being born a Jew. They're trying to use those modes to enter into the new covenant. And Paul says, uh, he says, I am amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. It's actually a different gospel if you try to enter into the new covenant in any other way than what God has prescribed in his word. So that would include circumcision. That would include trying to enter into covenant with him by baptism. That would include trying to enter into covenant with him by praying a prayer or um, by doing good works, by adhering to the law. None of those things are prescribed as modes of entering into the new covenant with God. The, um, the prescribed mode is repentance and faith. And specifically in the book of Galatians, faith, okay? So let's look at number two. Union with his person. What actually is union with Jesus Christ? Here's a question. Look at um, 
Galatians chapter one. In verse 18, Paul says, he's speaking about his ministry. He's, um, he is um, proving himself to be a, a true apostle, a true authority, okay? And he says, in verse 18, he says, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. That's really important. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. There's a lot there um, about Paul's ministry, but specifically what I want to focus on as we're talking about union with Christ is that little phrase, the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. And the Bible talks about, um, uh, or our confession talks about two different um, ways of looking at the church. You can look at the church as an invisible church, which is um, the body of Christ, the one body of Christ, the one church of God, all the saved saints throughout the world in all of history, or visible churches like this one. So um, when Paul speaks of the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, he's talking about specific physical places, um, physical people who are uh, united to one another in fellowship, okay? And these churches are in Christ. So here's the question. Are we united to Jesus's human nature? Are we united to his divine nature? Or are we united to both? Which one of Christ's natures are we united to? That's the question. It's a little bit of a trick question. Yeah, Lee. We're uh, united to his divine nature, but being united to his divine nature, I think we're united to his human nature too. We are, we are united to both natures, um, but it was a bit of a trick question because of the way that I worded it. Do you want to, um, yeah, Pastor Michael? I think a good way to think about it is that we're united to his person. Yeah. And Amen. he's one person with two, div- two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. So we are united to him. Uh, we are united to the whole Christ. Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you see in Galatians chapter one, it says, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. It doesn't say in his human nature or churches united to his divine nature or the churches united to um, God only. It doesn't say that. It says the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So as Christians when we exercise saving faith in God, saving faith in Jesus Christ, we're actually united to his person. So if you look at your outline, the way that I've um, put this is, number two, union with his person. Number three, crucified with his person. Number four, substituted by his person, and so on. We're united to the person of Jesus Christ. Um, Now, real quick, This is really relevant, okay, to the study of union with Christ, and it gets really, really applicatory really fast, okay? So um, what is the difference when we're talking about the Trinity, when we're talking about the hypostatic union and these things, what is the difference between an essence and a person? Because we say that um, there is one God, one essence, and we say that there are three persons. So what's the difference between those two things? An essence is a what, and a person is a who, really simply, okay? If you want to really boil it down, an essence is a what, and a person is a who. So if somebody came up to me, and they didn't know who I was, they might say, uh, they might say who are you? And I would say, I'm Tyler Renfro, okay? But if somebody came up to me, and they said, what are you? That's a little bit of a different question. And I would say, if I'm thinking rightly, I would say, um, I'm made in the image of God. I'm a body and a soul united in one person. I'm a human being, right? That's what I am. Jesus Christ 
has two natures. In other words, he has two beings. You ever thought about it like that? He has two essences. He has a divine essence and he has a human essence and they're united together in one person. So why does this matter? It matters because um, when somebody becomes a Christian, uh, their initial feeling of distance from God is usually because of sin. They see themselves as distant from God because of how much they've sinned, right? And that gap is closed when um, they come to a saving knowledge of the gospel. They realize that God has made provision for that distance in the gospel. He separated my sins as far as the east is from the west, right? Um, but then it might become a little bit more difficult when you start thinking about um, what God is. God is omnipresent. I'm confined to a little space. God is self-sufficient. I'm in need of him at every moment. God is omniscient. I have a really, really, really tiny bit of knowledge of him and of the rest of the world. I mean, I am uh, minuscule in comparison to him. Um, so a Christian might see that God has made provision for the distance between him and God by means of the cross, um, but they not, might not see how the gap is closed with respect to um, what we call his incommunicable attributes. They might not see how the distance is, how the gap is closed between uh, God's infinitude and their finitude. God has made provision for that in union with, with Christ. How, can, um, how close can a man get to God? As close as the human nature of Christ is to the divine nature. That's awesome, right? When you become united to Christ, you become united to God the Father. Why? Because indirectly, being united to the Son his human nature and his divine nature are united in that one person that you're united to. Amazing, right? That's awesome. That becomes, um, uh, that becomes a sweet, sweet aroma when you're reading the word. When you're reading John chapter 17 and Jesus is praying for you um, in, in God's presence. It's a, a very sweet thing to a Christian. So before we move on, anybody have any questions about that? It's a tough topic, but it is, um, it is a, a really precious thing. And we should know these things. We should know them like the back of our hand. Um, this, is, uh, this is the foundation of our Christian walk. This is the foundation of all of our happiness and all of our joy and all of our peace and all of our hope in the Christian walk. This is really, really important. You should understand this. So any other questions? Okay. Let's move on to number three. So now that, now that we've talked about what union with Christ is, let's look at um, what it means to be crucified with his person. So open up to Galatians chapter two, and we're gonna start at verse 15. Actually, we'll start at verse uh, 11. Again, Peter is, um, he is uh, buttressing his own uh, apostleship. Okay, he says in verse 11, but when Cephas, that's just an, um, another name for Peter. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, that is when, um, when the uh, Jews came, when Jewish leaders came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So let's take a little bit of a step back as we're moving forward in Galatians chapter two. If you remember the, um, the context of the book of Galatians, there's two covenants, right? There's an old covenant and a new covenant. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, he sees a big blanket drop from the sky with all kinds of animals in there, pigs and everything else, things that Jews were not supposed to eat. And God says, um, what I've made clean, you should no longer consider unclean. And so um, the application of that text is that Peter can, uh, that the gospel, that the covenant people of God has expanded its scope to include not only the Jews, but the Gentiles. For God so loved the world, not just Jews, but people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The covenant people of God um, includes people from every tribe, tongue, people and nation, okay? So Peter recognizes rightly 
that he can have fellowship and eat with a Gentile who uh, under this door, under the old covenant door, that would be considered um, eating or fellowshipping with sinners, you see? Because a Gentile was someone who was outside of the people of God. So they were considered sinners to the Jews. So when the circumcision comes, uh, when religious Pharisees come, uh, Peter is concerned that um, he would be perceived by these Jews as having fellowship with sinners, him being inside the door and these other people being outside the door. And so he fears that um, they'll consider him, uh, uh, again, having fellowship with sinners. So look at verse 13. The rest of the Jews, these are um, Jews who have entered into both doors. Jews who were previously under the old covenant and now have moved into the new covenant. So when he says the rest of the Jews, he's speaking of Christian Jews. He says the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? He says, we're Jew, this is really important. He says, we're Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now, somebody under the old covenant was considered a sinner if they were not um, circumcised on the eighth day, if they were not um, uh, raised a Jew, uh, an old covenant uh, uh, person of God, an old covenant God-fearer, um, they were considered a sinner. So that's somebody who eats a, uh, bacon. That's a sinner <laughs> in a Jew's eye, okay? So he says, we're Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we, Jews, have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Okay. What Paul is saying essentially is justification. Is, it a, is that an old covenant blessing or is that a new covenant blessing? It's a new covenant blessing, Right? So what Paul is saying is, we're Jews by nature. We're not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that this new covenant blessing is not received by the same means as old covenant blessings, we are justified by faith. What Paul is doing is he's distinguishing between an old covenant uh, mode of uh, receiving blessings and a new covenant mode of receiving blessings. The old covenant mode being circumcision, natural generation from Abraham, biological relation to Abraham, and works of the law. That's an old covenant mode of receiving old covenant blessings. The new covenant mode for receiving new covenant blessings, receiving Christ, receiving justification here in Galatians chapter two, is faith. So he says, However, because this is the objection, right? In verse 17, while seeking to be justified in Christ, while seeking to receive this new covenant blessing, we ourselves also have been found sinners. Is Christ then a minister of sin? And when he says sinners there, he's not referring to breaking the 10 commandments. He's referring to um, being a Gentile, being outside of the old covenant. Uh, He says, if if while seeking to receive a new covenant blessing, we're found to be outside of this door over here, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. Why? Here's why. He says, for if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. A transgressor not of the old covenant, but of the new covenant. If you try to enter into the new covenant through old covenant means, you're a transgressor. Why? Why? Because when the new covenant came with better blessings, with better promises, it made the old covenant obsolete, right? So if I rebuild what I once destroyed, the old covenant being destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor of this new covenant. You see? He says in verse 19, for through the law, here's here's where it starts to get to union with Christ, okay? 
Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Look at your uh, outline. Verse 19, the law, an instrument leading to extrospection. You've heard of introspection before. That's morbidly looking at yourself, right? So what the law does, the law acts like a mirror and it causes you to see all your defects, all your abnormalities, all of your failures, you see? All the things worthy of reproach, that's what the law does. And by doing so, it causes you to extrospect, to look outside of yourself. I recognize that I'm not able, <laughs> once you try that key, that old covenant key, trying to get into this new covenant door, and you realize it hasn't worked, in other words, when you're trying to look in yourself to receive new covenant blessings like justification, you realize that you fall far short. That's what the law does for you, is it shows you how, fall, how far you fall short, you see? So it causes you to look outside yourself. That's why Paul says, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. If you've ever, um, if you've ever looked at the law for any period of time, especially the 10 commandments, you recognize that you've broken every single one of them, right? I'm a coveter. I'm an idolater, an adulterer, a liar, a thief. I've got other gods, other things that are more important than God at certain times, right? Um, it should cause you to loop, lose hope in and of yourself so that you look outside of yourself for hope. That's why you die to the law. You die to yourself. You die to the old covenant means of entering into relationship with God. So verse 19, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. That's the extrospection, you see? So that I might look outside of myself to be able to live to God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. There's union with him. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Why did Jesus Christ have to die if the way of entering into the new covenant and receiving new covenant blessings was through the same means as the old covenant? Why do you have to die? If you believe that your own righteousness is going to cause you to be justified, then Christ never had to be sent. You see how um, there's no need for good works in the new covenant? Um, the new, uh, good works are uh, never in the new covenant meant to be meritorious. They're always meant to be um, acts of thankfulness for what Christ has already done. So verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. That's a kind of participation, you see, in your outline. Participation, I've been crucified with Christ. So how do I participate in the death of Jesus Christ? Through union with him, Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, takes the blame for all the ways that I've broken his law. I've coveted. So Jesus Christ on the cross um, uh, takes uh, the, the works that I have and he puts them on. And the father looks upon me, uh, I'm sorry, the father looks upon Christ as though he did all the sinful coveting that I did, all the sinful adultery that I did, all the sinful lying that I did, and so the Father punishes Jesus Christ on the cross as though it were me. So I, therefore, have been crucified with him. That's, a, that's the beautiful result of union with Christ. It should cause you to breathe as a Christian, right? I no longer have that big burden on my back. I no longer have this um, extreme, insurmountable responsibility. <laughs> uh, this insurmountable means of entering into covenant with God. I would never be able to uh, open up that new covenant door with an old covenant key. So that's participation. Participation with Christ at his death. Let's look at um, Galatians chapter three and we'll start at verse one. Okay. Paul says, you foolish Galatians, why? Why? because they were trying to enter into the new covenant with old covenant means, okay? You foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Really strong language. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. 
He calls them foolish because they know there's a new mode, but they're still trying to enter into the uh, new covenant through old covenant means. They saw Jesus Christ crucified, and he says, if righteousness comes through the law, why was he even sent in the first place? You see? They're foolish. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? What does he mean by receive the Spirit? What do you think? What do you think he, re- he means by receive the Spirit? You think he means like speaking in tongues, like that kind of thing? Oh, open up for uh, the, the mic. What does he mean by receive the Spirit? Don't be shy. I've been talking for a long time. (laughs) It's more simple than, than you think. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? When somebody hears the gospel and they exercise saving faith in Jesus Christ, they receive the Spirit. And what kind of a work does the Spirit do in them? Regeneration. That's exactly right. The Holy Spirit causes us to be born again. You ever wonder why he says born again in John chapter 3? It's not necessarily because, like, um, as a human being, I'm I'm born a, a physical human infant. It's because of what the Jews uh, believed about entering into covenant with God. Jews entered into covenant with God by natural generation, biological birth. If you were born a Jew, like, like in, um, in the book of Matthew, when John the Baptist is speaking against those Pharisees, he says, don't think that you can say to yourselves that, that uh, we're children of Abraham. God is able to bring up children of Abraham from these rocks. <laughs> Don't think to yourself that you can enter into this new covenant with God through natural birth. You got to enter into this new covenant with God through spiritual birth. You see? Receiving the spirit. So Paul says, how did you receive this spiritual generation? By hearing with faith, not by works of the law. Okay? So he says in verse four, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, uh, so then... Does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Hearing with faith, of course. So spiritual generation is by new covenant mode, faith. Even so, Abraham, even Abraham, the father, the biological father of all the Jews, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Righteousness, a new covenant blessing, justification, Why is that a new covenant blessing? Because when we become saved, when we receive salvation, we're receiving a righteousness that's not from ourselves. Um, Galatians chapter four says, Jesus Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. Why? So that he might redeem those who are under the law. You see? When we're um, born as human beings, made in the image of God, we're required by him to perfectly conform to his moral law. And um, so he sent his son, so that he would uh, uh, perform all of those ordinances, all of those statutes, all of those commandments on our behalf, you see? That's why we receive a righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, okay? Therefore, in verse seven, be sure that it is of those uh, who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Now this, this would boggle a Jew's mind. A Jew would say, wait a minute, I'm a son of Abraham because my father was, uh, my father's name was, I don't know, Jewish name, Backbuck, and his father's name was Buki, and his father's name was, you know, Belshazzar, I don't know. (laughs) Um, They would trace their genealogy all the way up to Abraham, you see? So you're telling me that I can become a son of Abraham through faith? Yes. Um, That's why Galatians chapter 4 mentions these two women, these two wives that Abraham married, Sarah and Hagar. And they represent two covenants, the covenant of works, I'm sorry, um, the old covenant and the new covenant. Paul says, we are children of Abraham under the new covenant by faith. Abraham is the father of the faithful. So verse eight, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and not by circumcision, not by natural generation, not by keeping the law, by faith, 
preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Not just Jews, but all the nations will be blessed in you. Blessed with new covenant blessings. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Okay, make sense? Yes? Got it? Verse 10. We're getting into union with Christ now. For as many as as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Um, it's really common, not only for Jews, but for people today to think that they can um, uh, be justified by works of the law, by baptism. Uh, I pray every day. I read my Bible every day. I go to church. I go to small group. You know, I help granny cross the street. <laughs> All kinds of things. People try to justify themselves by good works. Paul says, okay, if you want it to be on the basis of the law, look at the law. Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says this, cursed is everyone, no exceptions. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things, no exceptions, all things written in the book of the law to perform them. If you don't perform every statute, every ordinance, every commandment in the law, you are cursed. And what is this curse? The Bible um, again and again and again and again um, holds forth uh, two perspectives that God has on man. You're either cursed or you're blessed. You either receive salvation or damnation. You see? That's what it means to be cursed. So that's a really, really controversial thing. That's a really, really uh, countercultural thing to talk about. If you do not abide by every single statute, every single ordinance, every single commandment in the Bible, you're cursed and you're gonna go to hell. If you lie one time, have you abided by all things written in the book of the law to perform them? No, you're cursed. You're gonna go to hell. You see? So what's the answer? Because there are some people who go to heaven. Did they do it by abiding by the works of the law? No. Verse 11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God. You see how he's speaking in terms of um, uh, like exclusivity, like um, every single without exception, uh, no one is justified by the law before God. He says, for the righteous man shall live by faith. There's a new mode. It's not circumcision, works of the law, natural generation. It's um, uh, circumcision of the heart or regeneration. It's faith, you see? It's spiritual generation. He says in verse 12, the law is not a faith. Don't try to mix them. Don't try to mix them. That's what people do all the time. They're totally mutually exclusive. Faith and works Totally different, different in nature, different in substance, entirely different. One looks within and one looks without. You can't have both. There's only one basis. It's either gonna be your own works or Christ's. He says, the law is not of faith. Stop trying to mix them. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. If you practice the works of the law, you live by the works of the law. If you, uh, in verse Uh, let's see. In verse 11, the righteous man shall live by faith. You see, you're either gonna live by faith or works of the law, one or the other. That's all that Paul is trying to say is they're totally mutually exclusive. Verse 13, here's union with Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That's where we find substitution in the Bible. You see, in uh, the fourth point there, substitution by his person. That's what union with Christ does for us. That's another result. So at the beginning, we talked about what union with Christ actually is. It's a, uh, a mystical union with his person, not with one or the other of his natures, but what union with Christ is, is a uni- uh, uh, being unified to his person mystically. And in that, the result of that, we see substitution. He gets to take our place. Jesus Christ redeems us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. 
Any questions as we're moving on? The background is really important. That's why I spend so much time in it is because it fills all the spaces that um, come at the end with the conclusion of union with Christ. You see? Okay. Questions? Yes? No? I want it to be interactive if possible. So, yeah. I don't want to detract from what you were just saying about union with Christ. You had said something a, a, a little while ago, and I just want you to clarify. You know, so I'm not trying to side sidetrack you or anything. Mm -hmm. When you ask the question about um, that that Paul poses to them, uh, having uh, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by faith? You had you had communicated that in that context receiving the spirit like equa is equated with regeneration right and then you had made the com and then you had made the comment that um, what Paul says is you receive the spirit by faith so in a sense communicating in that way I, I know what you oh, believe I, I know what you believe <laughs> I know what you believe but I just wanted you to clarify what you said because that kind of communicates well, how do you receive regeneration? Yeah, yeah. By the means of faith, which would communicate, you know, faith precedes regeneration. So, like, um, can you care clarify, you know, where, is that what you're saying? Is that not what you're saying? Um, and what, like, what does, um, what is he really, really doing there? Is he, is he saying you received regeneration by faith? Or, or is he... Um, just painting a contrast because what he says is having begun in the spirit are you now being made perfect by the flesh so the he's really not focusing on uh, necessarily um, faith as it relates to regeneration but how their relationship to God how it began how their acceptance with God you know, was, was received, you know, by a work of God, not by a work of the flesh mm -hmm. and uh, how that's, that's contrasted. So I, I think maybe it, it might be hard for you to go back and remember exactly, you know, what you said and what you're not saying and what you did say. But um, it's, it seems like he's talking about their thinking that they're going to be, you know, um, made perfect or uh, as, as Christians, that they're going to continue in the faith and persevere to the end by means of the law. Um, so if you would, like, will you just clarify? Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. I'm, I'm really thankful that you said that um, because faith is, is not, a, um, it's not a work of the flesh. You know, faith is um, clearly in the Bible described as a gift from God and as a, um, uh, as a logical um, outcome of regeneration. So faith, um, uh, faith comes after regeneration logically. Um, so I, again, yeah, I, I don't think that, um, uh, I don't think that he means that, um, like, uh, somebody by the work of their own mind and their own strength and their own resolution and those kinds of things are going to cause them to be born again. Um, uh, but I think what he means by like receiving the spirit, um, is like, uh, God's communication of grace to them. Like in um, Matthew chapter uh, seven, he says, um, uh, anyone who knocks, uh, anyone who asks, anyone who seeks, um, or I'm sorry, he says, um, will, not, uh, will God give to his son a, a rock if he asks for a fish? Um, so um, he's gonna give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. He doesn't mean like, uh, I pray that I'll be um, regenerated. Um, but what he means is anyone who is um, like Christ was uh, preaching the law in Matthew 5 and 6. If anyone is trying to um, obey me, he's going to need the Spirit to do it. He's going to need to continue on in perseverance through the power of the Spirit and not through his own flesh. So receiving the Spirit is like um, his communication of grace to them. The Holy Spirit works um, sanctification within them. So, um, yeah, that, that's really helpful. Thank you for that, brother. Let's uh, look at Galatians chapter 3. Verse um, 26. Hey, Tyler. Over here. Yes. Yes. Um, 
It, just, uh, I, I guess, a, a follow-up question to what was just mentioned. He doesn't mention um, by faith, but by the hearing of faith. So it was like in uh, verse uh, 2, did you not receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So is by the hearing of faith, like, is it worded differently? Instead of saying by faith, he says by the hearing of faith. Is there, a, like, a difference there, or? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't, like, uh, I haven't looked at that specific phrase. Um, just by my reading of it, I, I don't think that there's a, um, a difference. I think that hearing with faith is the same as exercising, saving faith, just a different way of saying it. Um, but um, I'm not totally sure, not 100% sure about that. So for time's sake, though, I think uh, I want to move on to the next section. So um, Galatians chapter 3, verse, let's look at verse uh, 26. Yeah, okay. In verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, this is where we're going to see identification and then um, uh, representation and then incorporation. Verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So where do you think we see um, identification in Galatians chapter three at the end of there? Maybe somebody who hasn't raised their hand yet. All right. You're making me nervous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In verse 26, through faith in Jesus Christ. Very good. Yeah, thank you. See, it's not that hard. <laughs> verse 26. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We become identified with the Son of God in union with Christ by being adopted as a Son of God. You see? He says, you're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I become a son of God. When I'm united to Jesus Christ, I receive his same um, stature, his same status when I become united to him. That's what uh, the gospel is all about, you see? It's not um, bare bones forgiveness, just forgiveness, just absolution of all of my sins. It's a heightening of my status because I'm incorporated into the family of God. You see, that's a, um, uh, if, if, you, if you haven't meditated on that, um, that, will, um, that will be the solution uh, that is answerable to all of your insecurities in this life. When you become a son of God, um, when you become a son of God, you're not worried anymore about what other people think. When you become a son of God, you're not worried about the future anymore because you know he's got you in his hand. You see? It's answerable to all of your problems in this life. Verse um, 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I believe this is um, speaking of representation. It can include more than that, but um, specifically I want to look at representation. When the Bible speaks of being baptized into Christ... Um, baptism is a, uh, it's an ordinance in the church and it's meant to, uh, it's a physical ordinance that's meant to convey a spiritual reality, you see? So when I am baptized physically, I go underneath the water. The word baptized actually means to dunk or to immerse. So when I'm baptized, I'm being submerged and it's a picture of going into the grave. Why? Why would anyone want to get baptized if it's a picture of that? Well, because uh, I'm represented by Christ in his death, you see? So when we become united to him, uh, we participate, we're represented by him in his death. 
That's why we get baptized when we, when we become saved. Because what we're saying is, I've been crucified with Christ. I've died with him. You see? And when you become united to Christ, you also clothe yourself with him. So throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's this theme of being clothed. From the very um, third chapter of uh, Genesis, Adam and Eve partake of the forbidden fruit. And um, the first thing that they realize is their eyes are opened and they realize that they're naked. Now, of course, that means physically naked. Um, but Moses put that in there. The Holy Spirit um, uh, inspired that in there to convey a spiritual reality of what just happened when they sinned. And it's that um, they were without righteousness. They found themselves to be unclothed. In the book of Revelation, um, Jesus Christ says to one of the churches, I don't remember which, he says, you believe um, you know, that you're rich and clothed and you know, bleh. But he says, you don't know that you're poor and blind and naked. Why? Why naked? Well, um, because you're without righteousness, you see. Um, and uh, in, uh, in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, it speaks of us being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So that, that's what happens when somebody gets saved is they clothe themselves with Christ. Um, they, uh, uh, they become identified with him in a way because he represented them in his life. He was, Galatians chapter four, born of a woman, born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. Um, he obeyed every ordinance, every statute, every testimony, every commandment of God so that he could clothe us with his works, you see? So when we become united to Christ, we are represented by him in his death and represented by him in his life. We're baptized with him and we're clothed with his righteousness, you see? Verse uh, 28. Here comes incorporation. So we talked about identification. We talked about representation and incorporation. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That's the most important one to Paul right now because these Galatians are trying to go back to old covenant, okay? He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. What's more, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Incorporation. I'm incorporated into the body of Christ when I become united to him. That's an awesome thing for us. When we, when we leave church today and we go to our fellowships, um, fellowship with a brother and a sister, totally different than fellowship with a coworker. Why? Because we're all united to the same person. Like spokes on a wheel, we all come back to the same head. We're all, parts, uh, we're all parts of Christ's body and he's our head. We're all branches coming off the vine, the one true vine, Jesus Christ. So we're all connected to one another. Um, the, the book of 1 John says, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of his son. Being united to Christ has uh, other benefits, other blessings than just bear forgiveness. We get each other. I was talking to a brother, um, I was talking to a brother Yesterday, I was texting him, and um, he's being persecuted by his family because he's preaching the gospel to them. And I said, um, uh, in Mark chapter 10, this is what, um, uh, this is what Jesus was um, talking to his disciples about. He said in Mark chapter 10, I tell you the truth, anyone who loses um, house or mother or father or brother or sister or friend um, or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake will receive many times as much in this life and in the life to come. You're telling me that I receive many brothers and sisters? Yes, because we're all united to Christ, you see? Okay. Let's look at, um, real quick, Galatians chapter five, one through six. This is the sobering part of Galatians. Look at verse two. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. If you try to enter through this new covenant door, through an old covenant mode, uh, you're not gonna get behind it, you see? That old covenant key is not going to work in that door handle, in that lock. You can only open it through faith, okay? He says, verse three, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You've been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You've fallen from grace. It doesn't mean, um, what, it, what it doesn't mean 
is that somebody can open this door and then uh, walk right out. What it doesn't mean is, is that somebody can um, receive Christ, receive justification, have all their sins washed away, receive his righteousness, be clothed with Christ, be baptized into Christ, and then be unbaptized from Christ and unclothed from Christ and walk out that door. No, that's impossible. That's not what he means by fallen from grace. What he means is uh, uh, you are, uh, as long as you are persisting in trying to open that door with an old covenant key, you are severed from Christ. You will never be united to Christ as long as you're trying to uh, uh, be justified by your works, okay? Um, really quick, this should not be um, an intellectual exercise for us. We need to apply this to our own lives. So as a Christian, how do I apply this to my life? Well, as a Christian, you should recognize that um, all of the gospel graces that you partake of are communicated to you through union with Christ. It's not through any other means. That's why in Ephesians chapter one, it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He doesn't say just justification, that's it. And then everything else is, you know, no. <laughs> everything else is a work of the flesh. Absolutely not. They're all spiritual blessings and they're all communicated to us through the vine. If, if this branch is not attached to the vine, it's gonna wither up, you see? Uh, it will be devoid of justification, devoid of sanctification, devoid of definitive sanctification and progressive sanctification. And it'll wither up and um, it'll be cut off by the Father and um, the angels will take it away and throw it into the eternal fire. You must be united to Christ um, or your uh, eternal purpose will be to glorify him in his justice in um, damning you for an eternity. Let's uh, close in, in prayer. It's a very serious thing to come before you, oh God. We come before you in the name of Christ. We come before you as united to him and not um, in our own name, uh, not of ourselves, not of our own works. How thankful we are, oh God. Being born sinners, being born just creatures, all the nations are like a drop in the bucket to you, oh God, as your word says. We're... Um, worthless and, and less than nothing as creatures. We don't add anything to you. We don't contribute anything to your essence. You're in need of nothing. You're self-sufficient. You're perfectly happy and content in and of yourself. And yet you stoop so low in sending your son, con, um, sending him to condescend, to be incarnate. The eternal God, the immutable God, who clothed himself with a human nature, for our sakes, out of love. We are so blessed and so thankful that someone so pure and above us would unite himself to us by the Holy Spirit. Um, what, uh, what an immeasurable gift. I pray, Lord, for um, converted people. I pray that we would be encouraged by these truths, encouraged by the fact that we're united to Christ's person and not just uh, one of his natures encouraged that, um, uh, that we become one with the Godhead because we're united to his person and his person is um, uh, uh, united to a human nature and a divine nature. We're so thankful for that, that all of our graces are communicated uh, to us through that. And um, Lord, I pray for unconverted people who may be listening. Unite them to your son, oh God. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.